Welcome to Fix Affair at Home. Thank you for joining us. My name is Wing. I'm one of the coordinators of the Fix Affairs, which are City of Portland, Oregon community resource events. And with that, I'd like to welcome our friend from East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Thank you, Wing, and welcome everybody to the virtual Fix It Fair and for joining me along with East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District for this Introduction to Rain Gardens um, <clears throat> workshop today. So this is an intro class and um, it's just going to kind of briefly run through all the steps that are required for building a rain garden. And um, my background is that I'm a landscape designer here in Portland. My business is Planet Earth Design. I've been a designer for over 20 years and I will share with you whatever pro tips I have for building rain gardens in my experience and uh, things to watch out for and things to look for. So let's get started. Oh, also, um, yeah, as Wing had mentioned, please feel free to um, ask questions as you go along and Wing will uh, relay those to me and we will try to answer them as we, as we head through the presentation. So to, uh, here's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna talk a little bit about stormwater issues, why it's important. Uh, to build a rain garden and why that matters, uh, the threats to water quality uh, that exist in our world today. Um, rain Gardens 101, the how to, uh, why, where to place them, how big to build them, those kinds of things. We'll see some rain garden examples and learn about the construction, how to build them, um, the proper depth and shape of them, etc. We'll talk about some plants that are suited to rain gardens because those are special plants that need special, uh, that have special requirements. And then a little bit about maintenance of rain gardens and how to take care of those plants and what to watch out for as you have an existing rain garden over time. Um, East Multnomah has a rain garden incentive program uh, with a little sign that you can post to um, show your neighbors what it is that you're doing and to help educate the public that walks by your house. So um, let's talk about stormwater, what it is in the first place. And to do that, we will take a look at the um, kind of the uh, water cycle here in the Pacific Northwest where we get a lot of rain and really we get more rain, um, not necessarily more rain, but we get heavier rains, uh, less frequent heavier rains it seems these days than um, ever before. So historically uh, what we're looking at here is the forest system and the forest um, absorbs a lot of water that comes down from the sky and um, most of it uh, gets either caught up in the leaves and of the water that makes it down to the ground. Only, um, only about uh, less than 0.3% of the water that runs through the leaves and the soil uh, makes it to the rivers and streams. So the soil absorbs most of that water if that comes down off the leaves. Uh, the leaves uh, evaporate the water back into the air. And a lot of it is um, kind of lost or held in that spongy layer that is between the subsoil and, um, and the trees. So that, that forest duff layers works like a sponge. So very little runoff to the streams. Uh, the streams get recharged through the groundwater and um, everything is cleaned naturally. Um, so with development, of course, uh, we remove a lot of trees, we compact the soil with our building, we build houses and hardscapes so we can move around freely. And all of those things uh, help prevent water from getting absorbed into the soil and lead to more runoff more quickly. So now we'll look at the post-development conditions 
where that water, you can see that there's a lot less trees. Uh, the soil is not that nice spongy forest stuff layer anymore. It's compacted. We have lawns um, and less plants in general. So now we have 100% more surface runoff than in pre-development times. So um, less evaporation, uh, more, more runoff. And still, you know, some of that uh, water makes it down to the groundwater to recharge the streams, but there's a lot less purification that's going on, and that's the key. So um, all of that water that is running off of our properties and off of the hardscapes, off the roads and um, everywhere, leads to a lot of uh, pollution in um, in our rivers and streams and the ocean as well. Uh, a lot of that is um, many different factors, including things like pet waste and cleaning materials when we wash our cars and let it, um, uh, that soap run into the streams, fertilizers, chemicals, um, uh, you know, even positive, not just chemicals for pesticides, but also uh, positive chemicals for growing our plants like nitrogen and phosphorus can uh, affect our streams pretty negatively. And also, um, so those little elements that you see asterisk there, uh, like hydrocarbons, the cleaning chemicals, copper and other metals, affect uh, little baby salmon um, in a really negative way. Studies, recent studies have shown that uh, these little salmon will die very quickly once exposed to any of these uh, particular elements. So that's really important. Another thing that happens with a high runoff content is uh, stream degradation. So a lot of these forest creeks and little rivulets of water uh, were not designed for such large volumes. And so what happens is that these stream channels get scoured out uh, making these very deep ravines, and that leads to uh, slope failure, soil erosion, um, and carrying all that uh, little bits of soil downstream and clogging up streams. So that's another problem that is related. Um, it's carrying all of that polluted wastewater, but also just the volume itself is causing this stream degradation. So, um, so the traditional stormwater solutions that we have used, like running the water into the sewer and um, downspouts that drain to the driveway and out to the street, um, are not really working that way that well. Um, our streams and the drinking water are suffering. Um, so we're looking for more of a, a nature-based approach to dealing with our stormwater. And that's where rain gardens come in. So a rain garden is briefly a um, sunken garden bed. Uh, it's kind of the, sometimes we think of a garden bed as a burned up little mound of plants. This is the opposite. So it's a little sunken landscape area that handles runoff from roofs and driveways and other impervious surfaces. Generally, when we're talking about rain gardens here, we're talking about water from the roof, um, from the downspout to the rain garden. The rain garden itself, this little sunken depression, holds that rainwater for a brief period of time and allows that water to soak slowly into the soil where um, microbes and soil roots and plants um, help to filter that water, take it up, and um, act more like that natural system that we talked about earlier. So here's the cross section of a rain garden. On the left hand side you can see uh, the roof water. Uh, the little uh, pipe is from the extension from the downspout where the roof water would come into the rain garden. You can see the sunken depression that would allow for somewhere between 6 to 12 inches of ponding depth. And then the important thing to remember is that there is an overflow, or you should expect the water to overflow in large rain events. 
and we have um, rain gardens are sized for historically 25 year storm events, which seem to happen more frequently now. And so it's important to think about where that water might overflow in a big rain event. Make sure that it's not heading towards your house, for example. There's a little bit of amended soil in the bottom of the rain garden. Plants are in the rate planted in the rain garden, and then the subsoil is undisturbed below it. Okay. So rain gardens are designed to dry out in about a day. And in the upper picture, we can see a rain garden during a rain event and um, that it's filled with water. And then within a day, uh, that rain garden should dry up and not hold any more um, standing water. So that's an important element of rain gardens is that they need to drain well. So let's take a look at an examples of what is not a rain garden. This is not a rain garden. It is a wetland area, and although rain gardens simulate wetlands, they are not actual wetlands. And so the scale is much smaller. You can see here that there are uh, plants that are growing in the water, their roots are in the water, and that happens in a rain garden. But the scale of this is uh, just much larger than what a home rain garden clearly would be. So that's not a rain garden. And this is not a rain garden. This is an example of a pond. And we know that it's a pond because um, it's got water lilies. Water lilies bloom in the summer. In the summertime, our rain gardens are going to be dry. Uh, rain guard, uh, I'm sorry, ponds have um, impermeable liners to hold that water to make it wet all summer. And we are looking for infiltration. So we want our rain gardens to drain. So this, a pond is not the same as a rain garden. Um, and people often ask us whether rain gardens breed mosquitoes. Mosquitoes bring all kinds of diseases and that's a problem. But rain gardens are designed to drain within a, about a day, within a couple of days at the best, at the outset. Uh, so no, they, rain gardens do not breed mosquitoes. Um, they're easy to maintain. There isn't that much to do, the same as any other uh, landscape area. Um, and you can build a rain garden yourself. It's not that big of a deal. Um, easy to dig and shape and lay the pipes. And of course, they can be pretty and support pollinators and wildlife as well. It doesn't have to be expensive to build a rain garden. Um, Certainly not if you build it yourself. If you're having it professionally installed, um, it will cost, of course, more. Um, and there might be, uh, you know, if you're just hiring a professional to just build a rain garden for you, there might be additional costs just to um, mobilize the crew and get them there for a day, even if it doesn't take a full day to build. So um, you might want to look at some other projects that need to be done at the same time and link that in with the building of a rain garden if you're hiring a professional. Um, do rain gardens affect home value? This is kind of a really good and salient question. Um, like most landscaping, if it's thoughtfully done and serving a purpose, then um, yeah, rain gardens definitely improve home value by reducing the maintenance costs of um, of the home um, and the landscape, sorry. Um, they help prevent flooding and, and drainage issues that might already be existing on the property. That's often one of the things that inspire people to install rain gardens in the first place. They help create uh, beauty and achieve landscaping goals for resale value. Um, and the general rule of thumb is that uh, a nicely landscaped home can increase the value of your home by 10 to 15 percent, depending on what it is that you do. But I would say that it's pretty important for you to let your realtor know that this is not just kind of a pretty landscape and that it's actually functioning, and to describe what you're trying to achieve with the rain garden so that the next homeowner understands 
that uh, why there's a sunken depression in their landscape and that they shouldn't just fill it up. So I think that's a really important piece too, because not everybody understands what to do with all of that. So let's look at some examples of what rain gardens are, what they can be, and what they could be for you. Um, a grassy swell. So uh, just planting lawn in a sunken depression can be an approach to a rain garden. This is an example in a development. Um, the plants are on the berm on the raised area and the sunken area is lawn that you would just mow. So uh, lawn can tolerate the kind of sunk, uh, watery conditions as many soggy lawns uh, demonstrate. But generally we're looking for other more useful plants for wildlife um, and pollinators. So this is an example of a newly planted uh, rain garden um, with plants and in a, in a landscape setting. And rain gardens can have uh, be very flowery and have lots of uh, interest for pollinators and other um, insects, birds and such, and um, create lots of interesting flowers through the season. Or simply um, kind of a grassy uh, nature, natural landscape with uh, native plants that um, just add a little bit of contour to the landscape and a little bit of interest. Um, or they can be a little bit more elaborate and be a focal point and a show place for, um, for the neighborhood. So you can um, watch what happens with the water uh, as it gets absorbed into the soil. So let's talk a little bit about how to build a rain garden. So generally speaking, the steps to building a rain garden is to first evaluate your site look at uh, whether whether you're allowed to build a rain garden in the first place. Do you have uh, steep slopes? Is it relatively flat? What's the drainage there? How much room do you have to build it? Um, with all of those things in mind, where would that rain garden be located? How big does it need to be? And lay, lay that shape out. Choose your plants and whatever decorative features like rocks or wood that you might want to add to the rain garden dig it, start to dig and excavate that sunken depression. And then finally, uh, disconnect the downspouts or connect the downspout to the rain garden inflow. And um, then you'll be uh, installing your plants and accessories, and uh, then you're ready to go. So the first step is evaluating your site. We're looking at a uh, bird's eye view of a home uh, on a property and all of the arrows um, are showing the direction of flow. These uh, lines are the ridge lines of the roof. There's one that goes this way and um, another ridge that goes this way. All the water flows down from the ridge towards the downspouts, uh, towards the gutters and ultimately the downspouts. And then um, also the water will flow from there to your rain gardens uh, on either side, wherever your downspouts might be. Um, taking a look at the site in plan view, we can see that there's a house with a walkway and a driveway. There's a shed. Um, you want to always find your high point and the low point on your property, in this case, the high point is in the lower right-hand corner, and the low point is in the upper left-hand corner. Um, these little lines are not that easy to see are contour lines, so it what it shows us is that there's a slight slope from this high point down to this area, to the corner of the house, and then it pretty much flattens out. Um, there's a little bit more contour down here to the low point. So, um, the water is basically flowing across the property in this direction, and we want to think about, uh, in these little circles indicate the downspouts. Uh, you want to understand the sizes of the buildings, and then you can calculate how big those rain gardens need to be. So um, 
little bit of math is required for rain gardens and um, we will talk about that right now. So this is a very simple house example where the house itself is 40 feet by 25 feet, which equals uh, 100, 1,000 square feet if you multiply one um, by the other. And so um, for our rain garden, we're looking for basically 10% of the roof area. And if we move the decimal point over uh, one position, we'll see that's 10% and that would be 100 square feet of rain garden. So 1,000 square feet of roof for 10% would be 100 square feet of rain garden. Now, if we made one big rain garden for the, for the entire house, that would be 100 square feet. But more likely, we have a roof that is flowing in two directions. So we're probably gonna have downspouts on one end and a downspout on the other. So you might want two rain gardens of 50 square feet a piece or four rain gardens if you have four downspouts of 25 square feet each. Um, so they get um, you know, smaller and smaller and easier to fit on smaller properties. I think as properties get smaller, it becomes trickier to find places that are appropriate for rain gardens on the site. Um, I find that in my own practice that um, it can be challenging to fit these rain gardens in and oftentimes they end up uh, to be kind of uh, narrow and long and, and along the edge of a bed. That's just one way to think about it. Uh, depending on your drainage, uh, that sizing could be 10%, it could be as much as 20% of that square footage of the roof or the area that you're collecting water from. It could be a driveway, it could be um, other hardscape. So uh, in order to determine how quickly that water is gonna drain into the soil, we need to do what's known as a percolation test. So, um, so to test the percolation rate of the soil, uh, first thing you wanna do is you determine the area that you wanna locate your rain garden. Once you've determined that, you wanna dig a hole in that area about 12 by 12 by 12. And what we're trying to do is to create winter saturated conditions. So we want to know how this rain garden is going to function in the really severe rainstorms. If how is it going to absorb the water? So it depends on when you do this percolation test. If you do it in the winter time, now at this time of year when it's pretty rainy, then you might only need to fill it once or twice to determine how quickly it drains. If you're doing it in the summer, you might need to fill it five times or more in order to really saturate the soil in that surrounding area to see what it would, how it would function in the winter time when things are really wet. So you're gonna fill that hole all the way to the top, make sure that the bottom is flat, uh, fill the hole all the way to the top with water, um, fill it again with water, and then you're gonna measure uh, how quickly that water drains. You can measure it by the hour, come back all the, you know, every hour to measure it, um, or you can just note how long it takes for that hole to drain completely. Uh, note when you start and when you stop so you'll know how much time has passed and how many inches of water, in this case 12 inches, um, has drained and how long it took. That's gonna equal your percolation rate. Um, so what we're looking for is two inches an hour is fabulous drainage and that's a perfect spot for building a rain garden with a 10% um, sizing factor. Um, you might find that you have greater than two inches an hour. Uh, fabulous, you might have seven or eight inches, nine inches an hour in some areas in Portland. So you can probably get away with a little bit smaller rain garden. Um, the least amount of drainage that we're looking for is a half an inch an hour. If you only have a half an inch an hour, you might need to increase the size of your rain garden by 20%, not by 20%, but to 20% of that roof area. So um, half an inch an hour is the minimum, two inches an hour is perfect. Uh, anything more than that is fabulous. So these would be suitable sites to locate your rain garden. And then um, 
a little bit of guidelines for uh, where to place your rain garden. Um, and those guidelines are, you wanna keep your rain garden 10 feet away from your basement wall and retaining walls. And this is really so that we don't get any um, flooding in the basement to uh, alleviate the pressure against retaining walls. So you wanna keep your rain garden way back from uh, structures. Uh, if you have a slab on grade or a crawl space with no basement, you can get as close as two feet to the structure with your rain garden. Uh, so garages, for example, or um, outbuildings that might not have a basement, just, um, just a slab, you can get up to as close as two feet to those structures. You want to stay three feet from sidewalks and driveways, any other hardscapes, uh, mostly because these rain gardens um, in large rain events might overflow onto those surfaces. And if we get a freeze event right after that, then it becomes a slick and a liability. So we want to keep them uh, three feet away from sidewalks and driveways and five feet from neighboring property lines. So 10 feet from the house with a basement, five feet from the property line, um, and then three feet from sidewalks and driveways. Also, you want to locate your rain garden uh, downhill from your a structure from your house, particularly, um, and your neighbor's house. You want to um, the reason for that is that, you know, we're looking for an overflow area. The overflow is going to flow downhill. If the house is downhill from your rain garden, the rain garden is going to overflow to the house. We don't want that to happen. So um, I try to locate my rain gardens um, forward of the house or, or in the backyard uh, and not along the side of the house because there aren't that many properties that have, uh, you know, enough room to stay 10 feet away from the house and five feet from the property line. If you have a very large property, great. You can fit them anywhere you need to. Uh, but in small urban lots, you have to be, think a little bit more carefully about where they're located. Um, you want, as I said, you wanna be thinking about the overflow uh, and where there's room for that to happen. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't overflow to the street where it always used to flow, that's fine too. Uh, but it's always better if you keep it um, all that overflow re remaining on your property. It's also important to uh, not build a rain garden where there is not good drainage. So if you have a wet spot, a place where water collects already and it puddles and it doesn't drain well, then it might seem like that's a good place for a rain garden because all the water already collects there, but it is not a good idea because it doesn't drain well. So uh, compaction is the enemy, drainage is our friend, uh, rain gardens need to drain. You want to think about the location of overhead trees. Um, where there's trees, there's roots, and you're, we're about to dig into the ground. So we want to make sure that we're not going to damage the roots of the trees, which actually extend past the drip line. The drip line is the outer edge of the canopy of the tree. That's considered the drip line. Um, the roots extend past the, uh, the um, drip line of the trees. So when you're excavating for your rain garden in the vicinity of trees, you just want to dig carefully, uh, like an archaeological dig, looking for those roots as opposed to trying to get through those roots. Also, we want to locate the rain garden away from um, utilities, septic drain fields, oil tanks, um, any underground structures that are already in place. So if we look back at our example, uh, we talked about the, the contour lines that are on the right-hand side, the high point going to the low point. So you can see that the rain garden, places where you could put the rain garden is kind of in the level area or with a mild slope, um, anywhere between the walkway and driveway, in this little area between the house and the property line. Um, we st we're staying this barrier of 10 feet away from the house, five feet away from the property lines, three feet away from the sidewalks and driveways and uh, your walkways, two feet away from the shed and the outside of the drip line of trees. 
um, be sure to call 811 or um, the, the Oregon Utility Locate Center before you dig. That's the law and um, we want to make sure that you're not cutting into any important utility lines like a gas line, um, power or um, sewer line. Uh, then you can start to uh, construct your rain garden by starting to dig once you've called for that utility locate. Um, dig your rain garden to about 6 to 12 inches and create a berm on the downhill side so that you, if you have a slope. Um, if, you are, if your property is relatively flat and you have a, a pipe going from your downspout into the rain garden, you might want to build the berm on the house side so that the overflow flows away from the house. Um, otherwise, if you're building on a little bit of a slope, you'll want to build a berm on the downhill side to retain that water in the rain garden. Here's a little pictorial um, of the steps to building a rain garden. In the top left, you can see that it's been sized and um, the shape has been laid out on the ground and the pipe uh, on the, in the upper left-hand uh, picture, you can see the little pipe coming in on, uh, from the right-hand side, that's the uh, inlet and then it's going to overflow kind of into the woods over here. Um, here's a picture of it being constructed. The pipe is in. You, it's no longer uh, on top of the ground. It's dug into the ground. Uh, there's a little bit of a berm that is built around it. They've taken the, the soil from the excavation and put it around the outside. And here's the overflow. We do not recommend that you fill it to find out where the overflow is going to flow. Um, there are tools for that. So use your tools, uh, levels, a line level is a really handy item when you're building a rain garden um, so that you know where the water is going to flow. Uh, and not just by the look, because we can be deceived by uh, the high ground and low ground. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, they're putting in a second downspout connection over here. Uh, here's the first one. They've armored the inlet with some rocks so to avoid erosion. And then in the bottom right hand corner is the finished rain garden. You can see the berm is uh, higher uh, on the downhill side to make sure that we have an even uh, surface to hold that water in place. The last step is to disconnect your downspouts or if you already have a disconnected downspout to take the final step and connect the downspout to the rain garden. And then planting. So um, we'll look at a couple of plant tips for the rain garden. Uh, it's best to plant natives. Native plants, especially in the Pacific Northwest natives where our, uh, we have very wet winters and dry summers, a lot of those plants are very tolerant of rain garden conditions. You're going to use the wetter loving plants in the lowest part of your rain garden where it collects the most water and uh, plants particularly wetland plants that can tolerate being submerged uh, will be in the lowest part of the rain garden. And then the higher up the rain garden, especially on the berm, you can start to use more drought tolerant plants, um, whether or not really going to be seeing uh, saturation of water on the berm. Also avoid aggressive and invasive species when planting um, in your rain garden because they're higher maintenance and a lower wildlife value. And you might be tempted to use uh, herbicides to control it if it's too aggressive a species. We don't want that. So here's a photo again of the top the slope and the base of the rain garden. Um, and uh, those would be the areas that we're talking about for um, planting different types of plants. The higher up the slope, the less inundation of water, the plants at the very, very bottom are going to get the most. And those are often rushes and sedges, uh, grasses, that can tolerate being submerged for um, a couple of days at a time. Uh, and again, in plan view, uh, when you're drawing out your rain garden, the top would indicate the berm area. Um, 
where the excavated soil has been put onto the top, the slope is where it starts to go down, and then the base is relatively flat, where it, uh, again those rushes and sedges mostly are going to live and some shrubs. So um, we're going to look at a couple of plants. These are some flowers that are suitable for a rain garden. Uh, Western columbine, a blue-eyed grass, uh, goldenrod are all examples of um, plants that are that would be happy in a rain garden, in mostly in the um, slope or the top of a rain garden. The blue-eyed grass um, is the most tolerant of shade of this whole group, and it um, can 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 tolerate pretty wet conditions, so pretty low on the slope. Uh, it can also take sun as well. Um, some flowering shrubs that work it for the rain garden would be um, Oregon grape. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we have a couple of varieties, tall Oregon grape, um, cascade Oregon grape, and creeping Oregon grape that are all native here. So depending on what size plant you're looking for, there might be an Oregon grape that's evergreen to fit your needs. Red flowering currant, a very ornamental rain garden plant, uh, would go on the slope of a rain garden. It's deciduous, so it loses its leaves, but blooms very early in the season. Um, very, very showy flowers and a big hummingbird attractor. As is evergreen huckleberry on the right-hand side. This is an evergreen plant that um, makes uh, pretty flowers in the spring that hummingbirds like, and then fruit that is edible as opposed to snowberry, which we see in the middle, uh, which is quite showy throughout the winter, bare stems, but uh, these showy white berries um, that are not edible and um, they tend to make a little bit of a thicket. Uh, our native rhododendron, not all rhodes are native, but we do have uh, one evergreen native rhododendron and a deciduous rhododendron as well. Uh, they would be suitable for the top of a rain garden, not in the rain garden. And the mock orange is, is a large, super fragrant shrub. If you like fragrant plants, uh, it's pretty large, but um, can grow on the top or the side of a rain garden. And for the bottom of a rain garden, um, in the shade, you might want to consider some different ferns. We have uh, lady fern, which is, uh, loses its leaves in the wintertime, or our native sword fern, which is evergreen, would be suitable for the sides of a rain garden. And sluice edge um, is a native grass that gets quite tall, is evergreen, and uh, would happily populate the very bottom of a rain garden. The rain garden is the, um, the bottom of the rain garden is the trickiest spot to locate plants because they get you know, the most water, um, the most, spend the most time underwater. And the sluice edge is uh, well suited to that. It gets about two and a half to three feet tall. So it really fills up that volume. Hi, hey, Amy, um, we have a yes. question that's come Great. through. Would you be open to taking a question? Absolutely. Great. Um, every one of my disconnected downspout streams onto concrete pathways that surround my house. Mm -hmm. How do I direct the water to the rain garden without having to break up the concrete to place pipes? Yeah, it, you'll find that in trying to find, uh, to locate um, spots for your rain garden, we run into trouble like this all the time. So there's a couple of, um, one trick that works pretty well is to make a little arbor type structure that you can extend your downspout over the top of and um, and then have that downspout uh, drop on the other side of the walkway. So you walk underneath an arbor that carries your downspout and then uh, you cross over the path with an, you know, with an overhead structure that uh, you, you walk underneath. That's the easiest way to get it over the top. Another um, thing to consider is rehanging the gutter to another corner of the house where there's uh, more space and you're better able to uh, find, you know, without where all the without having the corner where all the circulation occurs. Um, so if you can, re that's usually a professional job. You need to rehang the gutter, and it um, needs to tilt in the other direction. But um, that's often uh, a good way to decide where else that. Um, 
rain garden can go. And then finally, um, cutting through the through a pathway might not be that big a deal. Um, you do need a concrete saw of some kind to cut through, but you only need a small channel uh, and you can put a pipe then underneath there. Sometimes we can um, burrow underneath the sidewalk to get a pipe through there. If the sidewalk isn't that um, wide, you can bore with uh, water, pressure water or um, dig from either side to get across um, a pipe underneath that. Um, or, or really just cut the, cut the concrete so you can lay the pipe and then you can cover that with some stone. And it won't be, you know, the pipe is only going to be three or four inches in diameter. So uh, it's not that big. It's a little crack that you can step over. So hopefully that gives you a couple of ideas. Um, so looking at these, this group of plants here going across the top from left to right, this is a yarrow, which is a um, perennial that is evergreen and would like the dry area of a rain garden. Uh, the next uh, plant over is salal, which is an um, evergreen spreading plant, which would like um, a little bit of shade and um, spreads quite a bit for the um, slope or the top of a rain garden. This is a rush. We talked about a sedge, but this is a rush, which is another plant that can be at the bottom. It's evergreen and um, keeps a rain garden interesting through the winter. We looked at the sword fern. Um, and then again, from left to right uh, on the second column, on the left is a um, fringe cup, which gets these tall flowers in the springtime, and then they fall down other that um, kind of tumble over like a bunch of pickup sticks. And they make, a, they carpet the ground really nicely and um, they're evergreen for the shade. So a shady rain garden um, can be, if you have very well-drained soil, it could be at the bottom of the rain garden. The next um, image over is camas, which is a native bulb. Um, that thrives in a rain garden. It loves to live underwater uh, in, at parts of the year and then um, dry in the summertime when it's dormant. The next plant over is um, a coastal strawberry, which is a very nice ground cover that can uh, kind of uh, find its way all around and under uh, in the rain garden. It'll just find the places that it likes. Uh, this is a uh, broadleaf avens, uh, which is another um, kind of uh, evergreen perennial um, that seeds around quite a bit and makes a nice ground cover with these little yellow flowers, pretty subtle. Um, the bottom row is um, columbine, our native columbine, which we looked at. The next one is a uh, um, evergreen violet or uh, Streamside violet, so likes a rain garden condition with the shade, in the shade. The next um, plant is a um, Oregon iris. Uh, uh, this one might be a Pacific Coast iris. We have a couple of native irises. Um, this would be for the slope or the top of a rain garden. And the last plant on the right is, um, is a fescue, Idaho fescue um, or California fescue that uh, would like to uh, be on the slope or the top of a rain garden um, for a li little bit of a drier area. So, so there's a large variety of plants that can be used um, in the rain garden. Um, if you look at uh, information and you can find more plants at the East Multnomah uh, website down below, um, you'll see that most plants, their conditions are moist, dry, you know, sun or shade. So many of our Willamette Valley natives can handle many different types of conditions, including those of a rain garden. You just have to be particularly aware of those that are going to grow at the very bottom of the rain garden and make sure that those can tolerate um, very wet conditions. Um, so here are some uh, invasive plants that you would not want to plant in the rain garden or really anywhere on your property. And the first is the butterfly bush. 
Uh, there are, these are the um, old varieties of butterfly bushes that seed quite a bit. And there's a new generation of butterfly bushes that you can better, better um, supposedly up to 95% sterile. Um, but in my recollection, that's what they used to say about the old types of butterfly bushes too. So I would say stay away from them. Butterflies do like them, but uh, they can be quite invasive um, and grow in wild places when, where they're not intended and they seed quite a bit. This um, second plant in the top middle area is a um, knotweed, a Japanese knotweed, which is an interesting looking plant and that's how it got here in the first place. Uh, but they're quite aggressive and very, uh, very problematic and considered an invasive plant. Um, they kind of have a bamboo-like quality, which is, makes them interesting looking, but um, best to get rid of them if you have them because they're hard to get rid of once they get really established. On the upper right is, a, um, is an iris that is a um, water-loving iris and uh, has uh, shown itself to be quite aggressive in um, clogging up waterways. It's really important with a rain garden um, because they overflow that bits and pieces of root or plant or um, might end up in natural waterways and start to establish themselves in the areas um, outside of your rain garden. Even in the city areas, um, it, as you're digging uh, excess plants that have spread too far and putting them in your yard debris, for example, not all plants belong in your yard debris. So they might end up in somebody else's yard that's closer to a natural area. So it's really important to stay away um, from these plants. And in the bottom left is a um, chameleon plant or hutunia. This is one that you can still find for sale, uh, is quite aggressive and has been problematic in waterways. It's quite showy, so you might be tempted and it likes, really likes the water. So it seems like a great idea, but it, um, will spread beyond its bounds, and then it's very difficult to eradicate. Um, the same with bamboo is not, um, seems like it might be a great idea, but very difficult to get rid of, and um, its only plan is to take over the world. So um, be very aware. It's, um, bamboo is, is difficult to contain, even with a bamboo barrier. So um, think twice about bamboo. It's not on our invasive plant list yet, but it is a watch plant. And then on the lower right-hand corner is vinca, which seems um, like a gentle enough plant, but it's quite aggressive and will um, outcompete other native plants for space in the forest. It grows well in very shady conditions. So, um, it, and it's easy to establish and birds will take little bits of it to make their nests and drop them into the forest. and where it starts to run amok through forest floor. So these are plants not to add to your rain garden. And then in terms of maintenance um, and watering, uh, water for the first year only, and um, then your plants, that's really if you plant in the fall or really early spring, like, be, like by February, this month or next month, uh, then you might need to only water your plants for the first year. But I would say um, plan on watering at least or at least monitoring the plants for water for the first two to three years. Um, always mulch your plants after they plant, after you plant them so that they have and have at least a half an inch of mulch on those plants uh, to keep them moist and to um, keep weeds from forming. Uh, prune, weed, and trim your plants as you as needed, as you would any other part of the landscape. Uh, don't use fertilizers or garden chemicals. I would also add that it's important to look at, um, make sure that the inlet is cleared, that there's place for that water that doesn't get clogged up with, say, leaves from the gutter that fall through, come through the pipe and then get deposited right at the entrance of the rain garden. Uh, it can get clogged up with debris and then um, 
cause that water to go to places where it doesn't belong. So make sure you have a um, that inlet water can get uh, has has a route to get into the rain garden and clear that out each winter after the first rain so that you make sure that your garden is uh, flowing well. And that's all there is to it. Um, if you need any help building your rain garden, getting information about your rain garden on the um, East Multnomah website, there's a, um, you can click on this tab for the conservation directory where you'll find um, lists of professionals that can help you with all kinds of um, challenges from engineers, landscape construction, um, professionals, designers such as myself. Um, and if you are interested in taking some more of our workshops, um, there are some more coming up here at the Fix-It Fair. Uh, so look at their website for that um, and also watch our website for um, many more workshops that we offer like native plants, beneficial insects, edible landscapes, and more naturescaping. Um, and more information in the In Your Yard tab. There are some also some sample plans for rain gardens on the website um, that you can look at as well as um, uh, there's a fabulous um, guide called the Oregon Rain Garden Guide. If you Google that, it's a fabulous document that's about 40 pages long with everything and more that you need to know about building a rain garden. So check that out um, and uh, take a look at these different plans for uh, the sunny rain garden or the shady rain garden, uh, the different kinds of plants that uh, can be used there and their locations in the rain garden. If you live in Gresham, for those of you that might live in Gresham, um, Gresham has a great incentive for building a rain garden where they um, offer up to $200 for you to build your rain garden. Uh, you need to register with them and they'll approve your site. And if you are approved, then um, they'll approve uh, some money for you to build your rain garden, which is fabulous. And then here, um, if you are in Multnomah County, uh, East Multnomah Soil and Water and Conservation District, um, you can register your rain garden and get a free sign for your yard, as I said earlier, to help um, explain to your neighbors what's going on and um, why you're doing this and, and the, so that they can ask you about rain gardens too. And um, when we do have live classes, we like to take the class out for a field trip. So if you've got your rain garden registered and we're doing a workshop near you, we might like to take a class if it's in a, a visible area from the street uh, where we can take a look at your rain garden and um, so we can show others how it was done. <laughs> 